Good evening and welcome to NTD UK News. I'm Stuart Lees and here are today's top stories. Boris Johnson promises to review the potential use of a vaccine passport. Heathrow Airport reports a two billion loss, its toughest year ever. And Scotland outlines its phased lockdown easing plan. Prime Minister Boris Johnson Tuesday expressed his optimism on releasing all pandemic-related restrictions in England by June the 21st. He said the government would also review the potential use of a vaccine passport. NTD's Al Rhodes has more. During a visit to a South London school, Boris Johnson said he was very optimistic most restrictions in England can be lifted around midsummer and that using vaccine certificates to allow visits to pubs and theatres was a novelty for our country. We've never thought in terms of having something that you have to show to go to uh, a, you know, a pub or a theatre. Uh, and, and, and so there are deep and complex issues that we need to explore, ethical issues about what the role is for government in uh, mandating or, or people to, uh, to have such thing or indeed banning uh, people from doing such a thing. Vaccine passports have been discussed by countries including Greece and operators such as Saga Cruises as a way to safely reopen international leisure travel. We can't be discriminatory against people who, uh, for whatever reason, uh, can't have the vaccine. There might be reasons, medical reasons, why people uh, can't have uh, a vaccine or difficulties that they, uh, you know, the people, some people may genuinely refuse to have one. Johnson said Cabinet Office Minister Michael Gove would lead a review to thrash out the scientific, moral, philosophical and ethical question of vaccine certificates. Earl Rhodes, NTD News. Children's education deeply affected by the pandemic is under the spotlight. The government today announced funding to support extra schooling. Neil Woodrow has more. The extra £700 million funding package for education includes £300 million already profited in January by the Prime Minister. The Department for Education says there will be a new one-off £302 million recovery premium for state primary and secondary schools to further support pupils who need it most. The average primary school will receive around £6,000 extra and £22,000 for secondary schools. The government suggests the funding could help with additional clubs and activities in the summer, also evidence-based approaches for supporting the most most disadvantaged pupils from September. The National Tutoring Programme for primary and secondary schools will receive £83 million. The government says it has been shown to boost catch-up learning by as much as three to five months at a time. Further slices will go to the 16 to 19 tuition fund and support for language development in the early years. Commenting on the government's new catch-up package, the chief executive of the Education Policy Institute, Natalie Pereira, said while any additional support for schools is welcome, the government's package denounced today is not enough to support pupils to catch up on their learning and to provide well-being activities for pupils of all ages. The recent talk of extending the school day or shortening the holidays to give pupils time to catch up was not mentioned. But the Education Recovery Commissioner, Sir Kevin Collins, says he will be seeking to understand what more is needed to help recover students' lost learning over the course of this parliament. Neil Woodrow, NDD News. And Heathrow Airport says 2020 was its toughest year in history. It reports a £2 billion loss after passenger numbers dropped to the 1970s levels. Heathrow said the travel restrictions had been devastating. It warned that economic recovery would be held back unless long-haul passenger flights are restarted. However, its boss, John Holland Kay, said the airport has enough money to stay afloat until 2023. Under Boris Johnson's roadmap out of lockdown, published Monday, international travel could be able to restart in mid-May. Holland Kay told the BBC that he thought people would likely be able to go on their summer holidays. The Metropolitan Police says nearly 600 county line drug dealers and their associates were charged in the last 15 months, with hundreds of lines closed permanently. NTD's Al Rhodes has the news.
Met Police say between November 2019 and January of this year, over 580 county line line holders and their associates were charged with over 1,100 offences, including conspiracy to supply, possession with intent to supply and supply of Class A drugs. 20 people were charged under modern-day slavery legislation and over 150 vulnerable people were rescued. So far, over 300 lines are closed permanently. County Lines is a drug distribution model. Criminals set up a phone line to sell Class A drugs, mainly crack cocaine and heroin, from bigger cities to smaller towns and rural areas. Those in charge of the phone lines, or the line holders, often recruit children and vulnerable adults into trafficking the drugs all over the country to avoid detection. These individuals are often threatened with violence and are unable to escape. Earl Rhodes, NTD News. In Parliament, the row between the peers and government over a genocide amendment to the trade bill, it goes into its final round. A third and final version is just passing the Lords. NTD's Eddie Atkin has more on this. A genocide amendment to the trade bill passing a third time in the Lords. The government objected to previous versions which were rejected in the Commons. Those sought to give the High Court the power to determine that a trade partner has committed genocide. The government wants a select committee. But Lord Alton's latest amendment would establish an ad hoc parliamentary judicial committee as a compromise. This amendment emphatically does not reinsert a court into our House. Those participating will be former, not existing judges. It merely makes use of the tremendous legal expertise of this House in providing a credible analysis which no existing select committee could hope to emulate or achieve. The amendment passes with 367 votes to 214. The genocide amendment to the UK's post-Brexit trade bill aims to prevent the UK from doing trade with genocidal countries. The Foreign Secretary in a speech to the UN Human Rights Council on Monday calling out abuses in Xinjiang, China. The situation in Xinjiang is beyond the pale. The reported abuses, which include torture, forced labour, and forced sterilization of women are extreme and they are extensive. They're taking place on an industrial scale. It must be our collective duty to ensure that this does not go unanswered. Lord Alton says objections to the amendment come from higher up the food chain. Only the House of Commons can now put that right. This is now bound up with high politics, big vested interests, and not the deterrence of genocide. Parliament must not allow itself to become part of an alibi for inaction. Next, the Commons will have the final vote on the amendment. Eddie Aiken, NTD News. Eighteen people were rescued from inside a refrigerated lorry Tuesday. Cambridgeshire police said the lorry's driver called them at 11.30 a.m. after noticing the people and feeling concerned for their welfare. Paramedics also attended at the Haddon services on the A1M near Peterborough, but nobody was injured. The people are now being looked after by immigration services. On the 17th of February, three men were similarly rescued from a lorry on the A14 near Brampton. Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, on Tuesday, outlined her plan for a phased easing of restrictions. Eddie Atkin has more. Sturgeon's announcement in the Scottish Parliament came a day after the Prime Minister's announcement for England's exit from lockdown. She said there's limited scope for easing restrictions now, though Scotland's youngest returned to school this week. Sturgeon hopes to give more details in mid-March for easing from the end of April. The next phase of easing will be a minimum of three weeks later, so indicatively from March the 15th. Uh, we hope that this will include the next phase of school return. If all goes to plan, the next phases includes the return of more pupils to both primary and secondary schools, the resumption of outdoor non-contact team sports for 12 to 17-year-olds, relaxing outdoor mixing rules with four people from two households allowed to meet, the return of more in-person learning for university and college students before moving to stage two. And then a minimum of three weeks after that, so from the 5th of April, it is our hope and expectation at this stage that the stay-at-home restriction will be lifted. She said the hope is to progressively ease restrictions every three weeks, with a view to substantially reopening the economy 
from the last week of April. Hairdressers, gyms, hospitality and non-essential retail will have to wait until then. Eddie Aitken, NTD News. The NHS is to trial home smear tests following concerns about low uptake of cervical cancer screening. More than 31,000 women in London will be offered kits to carry out the tests in their own home. If the trial is successful, it could be rolled out across England. The tests are usually conducted by nurses in a GP surgery or a health centre. NHS data shows only around 70% of women are attending appointments. The kits will detect HPV, a virus that can lead to cervical cancer. If it's found, women will be offered a smear test with their GP to follow up. The NHS is withdrawing over 1 million high-grade masks made in China over safety concerns. NTD's Miriam Leatham has more. The National Health Service's Central Alerting System sent out the notice on February 18th and asks hospitals and care homes to take immediate action. The notice says the Fang Tien FFP3 masks may not meet the Department of Health's essential technical specification. While the investigation is going on, hospitals and care homes should stop using the masks. FFP3 masks are marketed as 99% effective against airborne infectious diseases. According to an NHS website, FFP3 masks are used when medical staff need to carry out potentially infectious aerosol-generating procedures, for example, when a patient is known or suspected to have the CCP virus. The NHS's notice also says it's seeking to confirm the origin of manufacture. The manufacturer, Suzhou Fangtian Industries, tells the BBC it has never supplied the firm listed in the alert. Marianne Leatham, NTD News. Up next, UK's competition regulator says Facebook and Google have too much power. That and more when we return. The boss of the Competition and Markets Authority says Facebook and Google have too much power. In an interview with the BBC, she said Google, holding 90% of the UK's £7.3 billion search ad market, is a problem. And Facebook, holding the more than a 50% share of the UK's £5.5 billion display ad market, is too much. He added that the two companies have a duopoly when it comes to digital advertising. But he didn't go as far as saying the companies should be broken up. Apple acquires a company nearly every three to four weeks. CEO Tim Cook has revealed details of past deals at its annual general meeting this week. NTD's L. Rhodes takes a look. The BBC reports that Apple has acquired about 100 companies in the last six years. CEO Tim Cook revealed the details on Tuesday in its annual shareholder meeting. Cook says the acquisitions are mostly to bring in talent and technology. He says the focus is on small, innovative companies that complement our products and help push them forward. Its biggest purchase in the last 10 years was headphone maker Beats. It paid $3 billion for it. Shazam was another high-profile purchase at $400 million in 2018. Many of the technologies it acquires, it incorporates into its own products, like its Face ID technology, obtained when buying Prime Sense. Many of the acquisitions go into back-end tech, but some are more curious. This includes a self-driving firm, AI companies, a weather app, a virtual reality events business, a payment startup, a podcast business, and a $1 billion stake in a Chinese ride-hailing service. The $2 trillion company certainly has the money to splash out, but the combined value of these acquisitions is comparatively small. It doesn't even reach single transaction values that other tech companies have paid out. These include. 
Microsoft's $26 billion for LinkedIn, Facebook's $19 billion for WhatsApp, Amazon's nearly $14 billion for Whole Foods. One thing that does seem clear is Apple's prudent spending has contributed to its largest quarterly revenues ever just seen, at more than $111 billion. Earl Rhodes, NTD News. There are a few arguments over what made the lights go out in Texas during the recent historic winter storm. Some say it's because the wind turbines failed, while others blame natural gas. But one energy expert argues there's a lot more to it than that. NTD's Don Tran has the details. When the record-breaking winter storm rolled through the U.S., Texas fell into a power crisis. Demand for electricity shot up due to freezing temperatures. The state's power grid couldn't keep up with it, so they had to institute rolling blackouts, leaving people without power for hours or even days. Some said it's because the storm stopped green energy sources like solar and wind from working. But energy expert Alex Epstein has a different explanation. What happened was the week before, they, were, they had a huge percentage of their electricity coming from wind, actually a very small percentage coming from natural gas because natural gas is forced to accommodate the wind. And so when it got cold, they needed to radically ramp up natural gas to four to eight times what it had been when the wind was blowing. But they haven't been very focused on resilience because they've been so focused on paying for wind, which costs a lot of money. So it's not that the wind turbines froze and that caused the problems, it's that the policies to promote wind and to underinvest in reliability, that caused the problems. Some sources reported that the Texas blackouts debunked the idea that renewable energy is unreliable, since both renewable and non-renewable energy failed during the snowstorm. But Epstein said the failure of green energy was inherent, while the failure in fossil fuels was caused by policy error. It's not something that happened with fossil fuels anywhere else. Fossil fuels did great in the Midwest, they did great in the Northeast, they did great in a lot of the Southwest. It was just in one particular situation where fossil fuels, quote, failed. But that means it wasn't a failure of the fuel. It was a failure of the policy that made the use of fossil fuels not as resilient as it should be. Epstein pointed to Alberta, Canada, where temperatures were much colder and demand was a lot higher. But its non-renewable energy sources were resilient enough to meet the demand. He also said that for the last decade, policy in the U.S. has focused on mandating or subsidizing green energy. Since 2009, three coal-fired plants were closed in Texas. This state is the leading producer of wind energy in the U.S., making up almost 30 percent of the country's total. Epstein said this push towards more green energy could be disastrous. The lesson is that wind and solar cannot power an economy because they do, they're unreliables. They do not give you power when you need it the most. So we should be grateful that we haven't gone as far as people have wanted to in the direction of the Biden plan, and we need to stop immediately. Epstein said Texas should focus its policy on what he calls reliable electricity and not surrender to the policy that favors renewable energy sources. Don Tran, NTD News. Up next, experts warn of a high risk of incidents when the UK's aircraft carrier is deployed to the South China Sea. Find out more after the break. When one of the UK's aircraft carriers is deployed to the South China Sea, what are the risks involved? At a recent parliament hearing, China experts weigh in. NTD's Lorraine Ferrier has the story. Experts warn of high risks of incidents when the UK's aircraft carrier HMS Queen Elizabeth is deployed to the South China Sea. They spoke on Tuesday at the Commons Defence Committee on China's military ambitions. We should see uh, and should see um, sailings through the South China Sea, just as, as the uh, law of the sea allows. Um, but I also think we're going to see more tension, more tension ar around them and therefore a, a greater risk of, of an incident. The aircraft carrier is scheduled to conduct its first operational mission as part of a freedom of navigation operation. An American destroyer will escort the HMS Queen Elizabeth alongside the UK's own destroyers, 
frigates, a submarine and a tanker. So just the vast uh, uh, uptick in the types and the numbers of these uh, exercises and normal drills, regular drills, as Beijing calls them, I think really increases the risk here of miscalculation, misunderstanding, misinterpretation. She said this year there has already been 44 incursions by the People's Liberation Army. Parton stressed another factor, China's increased focus over the disputed Scarborough Shoal. And we're just seeing an increasing sort of aggressive stance, increasing nationalism, propaganda about it. Um, uh, and that I think makes the risk of, a, of an incident, a collision between ships or like the 2001 where two aircraft coll uh, collided, just a little bit more likely. The CCP last year said that, quote, China will take all necessary measures to safeguard its sovereignty, rights and interests in the South China Sea. The HMS Queen Elizabeth will set sail in May from Portsmouth. Lorraine Ferrier, NTD News. So what's the dress code for online meetings? Jumpers are not allowed for debates in the House of Commons, at least. A member of parliament was recently told to dress properly. NDD Zell Rhodes tells us more. In a virtual debate on Tuesday, MP Jonathan Gullis tried to speak from his kitchen while wearing a jumper. But the debate chairwoman skipped his turn until he dressed himself properly. We now go to... We now go... No, I don't think we do go to Stoke-on-Trent. The, the, the honourable gentleman has to be dressed as if he were here in the chamber. A few minutes later, Gullis was allowed to speak after he put on a shirt and jacket and he apologised. Deputy Speaker then explained the rules. When people are participating virtually, then they are appearing in this chamber, the chamber of the House of Commons, and therefore it is absolutely imperative uh, that everybody taking part in these debates should be dressed in the way that they would be in the House of Commons. The House of Commons doesn't have any exact dress codes, but the rules say men must wear jackets. Although ties are not needed, jeans, t-shirts, sandals and trainers are not appropriate. Earl Rhodes, NTD News. Germany's Berlin Zoo welcomed the birth of a baby gorilla at the weekend. It's the first in 16 years. Eddie Atkin has the story. Gorillas Bibi and Sango became the first-time parents after an eight-and-a-half-month pregnancy. Neither keepers or vets have approached the new family yet, so they do not know the sex of the baby or its exact weight. Andreas Knirim, Berlu Zoo director, has been keeping watch. As far as I could see, the little hop is obviously doing quite well. Very important is how close the young animal is to the breast and how it holds onto the mother. The zoo team said the other gorillas seemed relaxed, though curious. They appear to be welcoming the new arrival. District zoo manager Christian Aust says he's proud of how they are doing. It's actually only her first baby. She's doing it with a routine and with care, as if she has had a lot more experience. So she's doing great. Young gorillas stay with their mothers for the first four to five years of life. Bibi is unlikely to have another baby during this time, meaning the new arrival will be the only gorilla baby at Berlin Zoo in two decades. Eddie Aitken, NTD News. That's the news for today, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Stuart Lees.